Hey everyone, my name is David Dunbar, or the Theme Park Evangelist. I'm in my pajamas right now, but you can't really tell because you're only seeing the uh, top half of me. So thankful that I'm done with another really long day at work. It was just one of those days where I got to work and I just wanted to turn right back around, walk to my car, get in my car, and just drive off and go get coffee all over the place and say that I've celebrated National Coffee Day, but considering what time I got off work, I decided I would just get one free coffee at United Dairy Farmers. And the funny thing is, when I was online yesterday looking at all of the free coffee deals for National Coffee Day, which is today, when I'm filming this, which I obviously am most of the time really good about uploading to YouTube, the day that I film, whenever I do it at home vlog. Now, if I go out somewhere, I don't always necessarily... Sorry, glasses are dirty. I don't necessarily upload to YouTube the day that I go out to vlog. And normally what happens is if... Sorry, foot is itchy. I'm always itchy whenever I sit still. <laughs> That's just normal. Anyway, um... Yeah, whenever I um, go out in public and do vlogs, like let's say I go to the Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter, maybe even the Cincinnati Mall, which is aka the Kenwood Ten Center, maybe even the Florence Mall, you're sometimes looking at hours later that I get the YouTube video done. It depends on how far I have to go and depends on how much I film that day, because I have to use the um, iMovie app, and I have to put everything together, and sometimes it's, like, really complicated, and it could take, like, way later on the day before it's done, so I could be home for hours before I finally get that uh, YouTube video done, and, uh, you know, uploaded to uh, YouTube and all that fun stuff, so... Yeah, I can't say that all my YouTube videos are uploaded on the spot. Most of the time, yes, my uh, at-home vlogs are done right then there. You know my Star Wars um, Weekends vlogs that were uh, technically at-home vlogs? Uh, those I actually spent a few days working on. And I did those a little bit at a time. And that was, yeah, yes, an at-home vlog, but I did not upload it, like, right away. So... Yes, most of the time, if I do an at-home vlog like this one I'm working on, as soon as I'm done with it, it's going immediately to YouTube. There's, like, hardly any editing to these because there really isn't anything to do. Um, it's almost, I would say the... Yeah, hold on, let me start over. I would say the best way to describe these is almost like a live vlog, except that I... Um, did all the talking ahead of time and I'm not talking to a live audience and asking everybody, well, like, what do you think and stuff like that. I'm not, like, looking for people in the comment section, like, like, oh, look, somebody joined, somebody joined and all that fun stuff. Yeah, usually that's kind of how I talk whenever I do an, a live vlog. And I very, very rarely do those. And I usually do those as, like, a very special occasion. So... That's why you don't see me doing those that often. So, now that I've explained all that, I did want to tell you guys that, yes, yesterday I did do um, another Life as a Working Disney cast member vlog, and I felt like I left you guys hanging by telling you guys that I was leaving out the uh, backstage secrets of the attraction intentionally because I wanted to do it in the separate vlog, which is what I'm going to do tonight since my brother's back at my parents' house tonight and he should be gone for another hour or two. I'm going to say another two hours at the most. This would be my perfect opportunity to come back into his basement, which, just a reminder, I am allowed to use when he is not here. And even though he is off today, um... He is not here at this time, and I'm allowed to come in here and 
just do some filming. I even told him yesterday I was doing vlogging or filming in here, and all he said was, boy. And he didn't even care after that. It's like, eh, I don't care. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm not here, so why does it matter to me? And, you know, best part is, you know, there's a door, I have it shut. My roommate upstairs, Andrew, who is the only one here right now because the other one's on vacation right now, can't even hear me because... He's on another part of the house, even though he has his door wide open as usual. And it looks like it's going to rain again today, even though it just rained yesterday. So, I guess the rain is just not done yet. But yes, tonight's vlog is about backstage secrets behind Tomorrowland Speedway. I did look in advance on my phone. I f keep forgetting I have Google Documents on my phone. So I was like, oh, I might as well just remind myself just in case I forgot. It's like, yep, good, I was right. It is that chapter. Chapter 16 technically is where I'm at. So when you go to Tomorrowland Speedway, normally all you can see is a bunch of cars like lined up in the um, background if you do happen to notice them when you're driving around. It's not like Disney is trying to keep that hidden from you. I mean, there's no way for you to not notice. I mean, yeah, there's a giant wall there. And Disney thinks, oh, we can deter guests from seeing past it. But honestly, if you think about it, there's a part where you're just about to go... Uh, through the caution area like literally there's like one part where you're going straight for a little bit after you go over the bridge and you're just about to do one last big turn and you're just about to enter that yellow caution area where you are no longer able to basically drive yourself where the uh, car basically goes under this big piece of track where at that point the car can only drive straight forward and that's it and, um, there is a sidewalk that will take you to that whole area where all the uh, cars are kept. So this is basically the storage area of the attraction. Any cars that they do not need that particular day, like in the event that it's slow, they are kept back there. Now, you can normally determine how busy the attraction is that day based on the amount of cars that are back there. And usually they're really good about pulling cars out as they need them. Now you might ask, you know, where's their storage in and out? Which basically means, where's their way for them to bring cars from the storage into the attraction? Where's their way for them to bring cars that are on the attraction itself, on the track, and out, out of the attraction back into storage? So... There is, you know, a certain way to do it. And you might even ask, well, if they pull out the cars, are they just going to be kept in storage? I actually have um, another secret about that, and we're going to get to that. So first, I'm going to tell you guys how they uh, get the cars in and out. So how they get the uh, cars in is kind of interesting. So whatever cars that are ready to go onto the attraction for the day, whether maintenance is done working on them, whether they're just ready to go to be pulled on, like, first thing in the morning when we're first putting all the cars in for the day. They're going to be kind of lined up right in front of the uh, track closest to the wall, track one, in other words. And they'll be kind of kept back a little bit of a ways. Now, there are some switches that are hidden over by uh, the uh, caution area. And that's all I'm going to say. And they're controlled completely by water pressure. Once the um, coordinators, basically supervisors, are able to get um, enough cast members from the uh, attraction, because there are some cast members that are able to leave their position... And the other cast members have to stay there, basically, and take care of the um, track themselves by themselves. And we're going to cover that later in um, 
all the different positions. So, for now, just keep in mind that they do have at least, like, four to six cast members at a time that usually are needed to go back and pull in some cars. So, they will go and they'll shut off however many cars are running on the tracks, and they'll stop them far enough away so that they don't accidentally get caught in the area where the um, tracks basically go down. And this is basically what allows the um, cars to come off. So yes, the cars technically can be driven freely. They don't have to be driven on a track. The reason why the cars are put on a track is so young kids... And people who just don't know how to drive or even drive know how to drive very well are able to drive a car without having to worry about getting into an accident. And this is the only time that you'll ever see cars being driven on and off is when they pull them off and when they put them on. Like being able to drive without that track. So the... Cast members and supervisors will jump into the car, and they have to turn the steering wheel really hard because these cars are not... Some of them, I should say, are not really meant to drive freely, and some of them are. Like, they just turn really, really well, which is really weird. And this is a tricky part. So, you have to position these cars just right, and the ones that have to go to the wall... You have to really turn it hard because you have to be ready to get this middle portion uh, lined up perfectly so that it will lock onto the track. So there are some hidden wheels underneath each of the cars. And this is basically like a guide wheel that allows it to stay on the track in the event that one of these does break, which sadly, some, time to time, the wheel does break and sometimes the guests unfortunately do uh, go off the track a little bit and collide into a bush. I've seen it happen before. It was kind of scary. I mean, you're not going very fast, so you're only going to suffer minor injuries. And that's why these cars have to be pulled off so frequently because, unfortunately, due to constant use, these cars are constantly being pulled off and maintenanced. You can pretty much say during the entire park day because... You never know what's going to happen to these cars. I mean, they are still regular cars. You can almost say they're like go-karts. That's basically what they are. They're go-karts, but on guide wheels that allow them to lock onto a track so that everybody can drive them. Obviously, um, if you have like a one-year-old or a two-year-old that wants to drive, an adult has to be with them. But that doesn't mean that the two-year-old can't, you know, steer the steering wheel. A steering wheel. I mean, obviously, there's going to be more of the car uh, bumping along the uh, track that it's on, more than the two-year-old doing the steering. I've seen some foreigners that come on, and they're like, I don't know how to drive this thing. It's like, I really hope that you know how to drive a car, though. It's probably the same exact thing, other than the fact that there's no brake pedal. Basically, you have to let up on the gas pedal, you have to, like, take your foot off, and that's how it breaks. It's very interesting, and then you push down on the gas pedal for the car to move forward, and that's more or less how the uh, car moves, and then the steering wheel, well, that's just normal, though. Anyway, so now that you know how they're put on, let's talk about how they're taken off. Basically, the same exact idea. There's another uh, switch just up ahead that's actually around the corner uh, on the other side of the wall, and I've done it really fast before because I've gotten, like, a lot of practice with it. And I got to the point where I could just, like, push down on all four at the same time. Now, you do have to go and walk across these, like, as a cast member, that is, in order to make sure they're all completely down. The reason why is there have been a few times where we try to get a car to drive over and... Sometimes we had to, like, slam down the gas pedal really hard and, like, steer it so that it would jump off the track itself. And only we knew how to do it. Like, if I could go back and do it, I probably could figure out how to 
make the car go off the steering the track by itself and it takes a lot of experience and practice in order to know how to force it off the track or even force it on the track i've had those moments where i accidentally missed the track while i was trying to match up the guide wheels to the track while i was trying to put the car on and i accidentally messed up and the guide wheels were like basically here's the guide wheels here's the track so i would say um hold on so here's the guide wheels here's the track sorry i forgot the camera was up here not down here so you're not even able to see what i'm doing so i would say i was this close to getting the guide wheels on the track sorry this close and sometimes I was able to slam my foot on the pedal hard enough and turn the wheel hard enough that I was able to force it on and I was did like a victory dance like yeah I did it <laughs> and then sometimes unfortunately they had to go get a device that they could put it underneath the car and then put it manually on the track itself and that always looked kind of frustrated and and trust me I wasn't the only one that had that issue. Uh, other cast members had that issue. And the uh, fun part about getting the uh, cars off the track, I could safely say most of the time we had to take cars off was because the steering went out on the car. And we always knew because the poor guests would come back and the car would be doing boom, boom, boom the whole way back. So... Yes, unfortunately, it does happen to you guys, and I can tell you guys right now, is I've driven one of those cars myself, because someone said, oh, this car doesn't have steering. And when I was at a certain position, which I'll get to that, you know, in the next chapter, I was allowed to hop in the car and see for myself if there clearly was no steering. And I decided, just for the fun of it, I'm going to go uh, full speed ahead. And sure enough, there was no steering on it. And I got whiplash. It was pretty bad. I, I mean, yeah, I recovered eventually. But I'll tell you guys right now, in the event that you do go on that ride and the steering does go out on you, the best thing you can do is go as slow as possible. Because the slower you go, the less you're going to feel that. Because if you go really fast, yeah, you'll get through the attraction really fast. But, um, you're going to basically get whiplash. When the steering goes out, the, the car cannot steer at all. All you're going to do is basically allow the uh, car to go bang, bang against the sides of the track. So, it was always fun because we had to literally turn off the car. Because there's a switch in the very back of the car under... Underneath the hood, you had to lift up the hood, and there's a switch there, and you would have to turn it off. And we had to go get a device. We had to put it underneath the car. And someone had to push the gas pedal so that we could even pull it. Otherwise, it wouldn't move at all. And we had to literally line it up down one of the maintenance tracks, which is usually one of the closest ones to the sidewalk. And once you lined it up perfectly, then you would turn back on the car and you would hop back in and then you would just drive all the way down. And when you do that at least 10 to 20 times a day, you get really good at it. But yeah, you're every now and then you're going to mess up and you'll have to fix yourself and all that. But trust me, it was the most common issue. Like... Every now and then, we had a guest say um, something was wrong with the car, and we just took their word for it, and we pulled it off, and maintenance would take a look at it, and they go, there's nothing wrong with the car, and they just put it right back on again. <laughs> well, they put it right back in that same area I was telling you guys about whenever um, we're, we're, uh, we basically put the cars back on. And it was always a pain, you know, We ever, whenever we lost cars, that was like lost cars we could load guests on. And 
last but not least, the most important thing was before we could even let the guests keep going, whether it was from this side, the uh, caution side, or this side before the uh, big turn there, we always had to raise those things back up. Otherwise, there would be cars going all over the place. And then we would have to give the all clear. Yes, you're good to go. You're, And I'll go over that in the position thing. I'll give you all the uh, hand signals you need to know. So we gave the uh, all clear. And uh, we would... And of course, we would have to literally turn off the car and raise the hood on all four cars at each track. In the event that we were taking a car off. And this way... The uh, cast members that were taking the cars off, whether it was one or two cast members at a time, would be able to know that um, it was safe for all the cast members down there. That is, would be would know for sure have a you know peace of mind, knowing yes, it is now safe. To lower these things and take the cars off. I hate to see it, but there have been a few times where I was down there. And a cast member failed to uh, get to the guests fast enough and turn off the car on them. And the guests would literally just floor it. And they'd come crashing into the car that I was just about to pull off. And I don't remember offhand if I was ever responsible for that happening, and even if I was, it was never your fault. If there was ever a time when you were supposed to turn off the car and raise the hood, and you weren't able to because that guest took off on you as quickly as you could, it does not look bad on you. It looks bad on the guest. And all they get is a dirty look. <laughs> Normally, that's all that usually happens. But, yeah, I'll have to tell you guys some funny stories about different guests that I experienced working at Tomorrow on the Speedway. And, of course, some of my favorites were at uh, Track 4 and uh, Fast Pass, and then, of course, Bridge. That's pretty much where all my favorites were at. Like, out of everywhere that um, I worked with in the attraction. As unusual as that is. Like, Grouper, I would basically say to you guys, I got the normal, you got the people that weren't listening, you got the people who didn't speak English. Merge wasn't even that bad. Actually, Merge was my favorite, by far. <laughs> Merge was a very calm, peaceful position, and I didn't usually get a lot of jerks at that position at all. It was, you know, pretty straightforward, so... I'm not going to complain about that one at all, but Grouper, you know, you got your usual, you got people that didn't listen, then you had people that insisted upon sitting together. You saw a pattern, basically, that position. It was it was funny. But, um... Uh, another backstage secret that I could tell you about Tomorrowland Speedway is uh, the uh, cars all run on unleaded fuel, so you might have noticed there's a at least, like, six gas pumps back there, and they have these giant hoses, which are, like, ridiculously heavy. And that's another reason why I would literally, like, be pouring at sweat and be just, like, tired physically and ready to be down the attraction for the a day by the time rope drop happened. I'm just, like, ah, uh, I'm just, like, you know, I just don't think I can, you know, just do this anymore, like, you gotta be kidding me. I just literally dragged around this big, heavy hose for the past two hours. Like, are you serious right now? Like, really? And I still gotta operate the attraction for the day. I'm like, oh, <laughs> It was awful in that sense. I mean, could you imagine dragging a big, heavy hose and filling up every single car, and it would always click whenever it was done. Could you imagine how much fuel Disney has spent on 
that attraction every single day and the fact that all these cars use unleaded fuel you won't believe the questions i even got about the attraction as disney considered switching over to an alternative as disney ever considered going on electric or as disney is there this is disney considered that blah 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 you know you got all kinds of different questions I'm sure that's normal at every single attraction, every single merchandise store, food and beverage store, or restaurant, whatever. You know, it's just uh, one of those, you know, things that you come across when you work for Walt Disney World. You're going to get all kinds of crazy questions. You know, a lot of people come to Walt Disney World for their very first time, and it's not every day you see an attraction, even though it's been around for almost 50 years. Where you can basically drive yourself around uh, at least a mile or two of track. It's kind of cool. And it's not every day where you can even see an attraction where uh, it's designed for kids to drive on. Because normally you go to places like Fun Spot. And it's designed for teenagers and adults to drive around. Maybe even preteens or older kids. But definitely not young kids, not by any means. And those same go-kart attractions, you literally have to have your hair, like, kept in a safe place if you have, like, really long hair. This counts for guys and girls, you know. If, um, you go to Fun Spot, you'll see, like, the motor's literally right there. Because if you're not careful, your hair could get caught in the motor and there goes all your hair, you know. But Disney World... You go to the Magic Kingdom to the Merlin Speedway. It's actually kind of safe for your hair to be kind of hanging out because the um, engine is underneath the hood, and the hood is behind you versus in front of you. There actually is no engine in front of you. You might ask, so is there anything special about the front of the car other than it's just decoration? The engine is in the back, which is normally the trunk. So I always found that very ironic about that attraction. And, of course, all the cars take oil as well. So, yes, a lot of the cars that uh, need more oil have to be checked for or oil. or It might be brake fluid. I don't remember. Yeah, that's what it is. It's brake fluid. Because you won't believe... The amount of brake fluid that gets used. Sometimes the brake fluid's like ridiculously low. And that was another thing that we had to check a lot whenever um, we were opening the attraction. We had to take all the gas caps off and refill the gas. And then we had to close that gas cap back, uh, gas thing back up again. And then, of course, you had um, the oil area, and you had to make sure that was full. And when it was really dark out, it was very hard to tell whether it was, you know, full of oil or not. And sometimes it was, like, really full. Sometimes it was, like, dead empty, or sometimes it was halfway full. So if it was, you know, at least halfway full or... Less you had to put more oil, sorry, not oil, I keep saying oil by accident, more brake fluid. If you ever came across, whenever I say, if I say oil, just assume I meant brake fluid, because that's what I actually mean. In the event that you came across the container, it was at least halfway full or less of brake fluid, then you had to top it off. But I wouldn't suggest overflowing it like I always did, because that was always a bad thing. You know, I'm saying to any of you who ever want to go work at that attraction, obviously, as guests, you know, I'm telling you guys that as a joke more than anything. Like, haha, let's laugh at David. Look what, you know, dumb decision he made when he worked at Tomorrowland Speedway. So funny, you know. <laughs> but, um, those were, the, like, the most major ones, so... Uh, one of the major highlights I did actually like about working at Tomorrowland Speedway in the mornings was the fact that we did get to do a ride around of the entire attraction. And, um, basically, 
the uh, point of the ride around of the attraction was to make sure everything was working, including the uh, sound. So we would drive around the entire attraction. As long as everything looked good, you would uh, make sure you went to the um, sheet that we had to fill out and put down that everything looked good. And we were good to go. So the morning was always hardest because some of the more strict supervisors were working well at first it seemed like that when once um the uh strict people left we had some of the nicer ones now they still had to follow policy you know policy said make sure you check mark stay in the box because it was an official document there was one guy i really liked his name was paul and i honestly got along really well with the guy he was uh definitely a good friend i would say and um you know, I uh, never really minded when he uh, always reminded us, you know, checks had to stay in the box. When he or some of the other guys told me to make sure my checks stay in the box or made me redo the uh, official documentation because, you know, that check mark just went slightly out of the box. It didn't really bother me because they were always very polite about it. But there was one supervisor that was just a complete butthole about it or jerk about it. And he would just come up and he would shove it in your face and make make you feel like a complete, you know, retard about it. And I just never really cared for him about, you know, just period. And not to mention he treated you like a jerk too. Like that one time I was uh, working and... Um, Someone went out of their way to buy him a Coke, and he was like, Oh, bless you. David, why didn't you buy me a Coke? You should buy me a Coke. And I'm thinking to myself, What the heck, dude? You know, where did that come from? And, you know, I'm literally just sitting there minding my own business, and he decided to draw me into the conversation. I was like, I should be left out of the conversation. Like, leave me out of this conversation. I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> like, I wish I could, you know, go and give him a piece of my mind after that. I mean, and the funny thing is, when he did eventually leave, he went to go work at uh, the Haunted Mansion or something like that. Then he eventually got fired, which I'm not going to mention why he got fired. I don't think it's appropriate. So, just, you know, keep in the peace, or keep, you know, a peace of mind knowing that he wasn't a very good supervisor, and he didn't have a good par personality, and it wasn't nice, and... You know, he kind of got what was coming to him, is I guess the best way to put it. So I was kind of happy when I did find out he got fired, no offense. But that was uh, pretty much kind of what we did at opening. We had to fill up all the cars with fuel and brake fluid. We had to do a ride around the entire attraction. We had to... Um, get all the car started up, but in the mornings when it was cold out, that was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, these cars were not designed for the cold weather. They would not survive any further than Florida. I'm pretty sure about that. I think that's why the attraction was designed for Central Florida in the first place. And, um, the nighttime was a lot easier because of the fact that as it slow down we were able to take more cars off so each track was responsible for putting away their cars and putting them on the tracks that they belonged and we usually had i think we had like certain tracks that they were like designated for it was like the uh odd number tracks were the um ones were uh, all the um If I'm not mistaken, all the left-hand turn, or all the... Because there's... And you'll probably notice this. If you've ever been to Tomorrowland Speedway, tracks one and three, basically, the track closest to the wall and the track adjacent to the track by the station, they all have steering wheels on the left-hand side of the car, which is unusual. I don't get that. I call that the British car. Well, technically speaking, no, actually the uh, other one is the British car. That's the American car, my bad. 
So those would go on the odd number tracks. Now the British cars, where the uh, steering wheel is on the right side, the passenger side, those cars went on the even number tracks. Yeah, I got myself backwards there for a minute. I was like, oh, my bad. Yeah, we had British cars and we had American cars. It was kind of weird. So that's how I always remembered. The um, left-handed steering was supposed to go on tracks one and three, and then the, which was basically the American cars, the British cars, the steering wheel on the passenger side, in other words, those were the ones that went on the even tracks, tracks two and four. And, um, f track four was always the last one that we pulled for the night, and there were times where Track four, no lie, we would be running until, like, the last possible minute. So if the park, for example, closed at midnight, then we, we would be running that all the way till midnight. And even sometimes later, sometimes we had no choice but to run that track until literally every single guest had gone on the ride. And we had to make sure that every single guest got off at that spot at the correct spot you know where the station is and then we would drive it down we had to make sure that none of the guests had the uh, chance to drive past um that section where um we could pull the cars on and off I was telling you guys about earlier because we would lower the things after every single guest would go by. Like, as let's just say, for example, um, we had, like, a few cars come back. So we would get in those cars... We would, and while we're waiting for the other guests to catch up with those guests, we would drive them forward to that area where the thing would already be lowered. Someone would be literally standing behind the wall cast member, obviously. And they would lower the things. We would drive them off. They would only have certain ones. They would only lower the ones that we're, only, we're already using. Usually, like, one or two of them. Normally, depending on what time of the day it is, we would normally be just lowering one because the other ones would already be lowered for the night because we're no longer using those tracks for the night. So they would just go ahead and lower that one, that, that, that last one we're using, make sure that the cast members get those cars off, then they would br bring it right back up again. So that way the next guests that are um, driving through, if there are any guests, would not actually go off. Now normally we wouldn't have to worry about that because there are no more guests getting in line at that point. Normal, uh, normally at that point we're just trying to get them off. But they would lo raise it back up just in case, you know, there was any guests that had any idea of just driving forward. But that's normally how it worked at night. It was kind of interesting, you know, just being extra caught and caught. Oh, wow. It was just interesting being extra cautious, making sure that, you know, guests weren't trying to get cars off and if we're trying to drive off uh we did this other thing called stacking basically first thing in the morning we had a very certain way we had to do it in fact it's so complicated i'm not even gonna go there we had to stack them in a certain way so that the uh when we did open the attraction we could get the guests onto the actual track as long as there was nobody driving on that track at the time. We could get the guests onto the track, get them all in their cars, make sure that nobody could drive from the front or from the, the or the back or anything but from by that means. 
make sure everybody was seated, buckled up and everything. And then we would start up the very first car and tell every single guest, you know, make sure you're buckled up and push down to go. Lift to stop. No bumping and you're you're free to go, blah, blah, blah. And pretty much everybody just kind of just drove off after that. And then we would stand there for about four to five minutes before that group of guests came back. And normally when we first open a track for the day, we don't usually have a lot of cars on that particular track. So as the day progresses, we'll have more cars added on. So you're not waiting too long. You're normally waiting two minutes and then another set of cars are coming. That's usually the max amount of time you're waiting for more cars to come. So that literally gives you just enough time to get your guests out of there and go back, walk to your position, look around, see um, how people are acting on the people mover for a second, kind of look behind the wall for a second if possible, see where they're at, make sure everybody's standing where they're supposed to be, maybe see if your break is coming or not. <laughs> Maybe look at the crowd as they're walking by. It was, it was fun, you know. Um, I'll tell you this right now. The one thing I did not overly care for that um, attraction was the fact that when you're standing there literally in the middle of the day, you're just like, ugh, like, is it time to go home yet? Is it time for my break? Is it time for my lunch? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, it was it was fun. And, um, especially when it's hot, you know, it, you really have nothing to do but, you know, to tell people the same old safety spiel every single time. At least where I'm working right now, I had the ability to walk around. I have the ability to keep myself busy all day long. I at least have the ability to go use the restroom if I need to. If I'm a cashier, I obviously can't do that. But when I'm a utility worker, I do have the ability to go use the restroom whenever I need to. I mean, I don't want to take advantage by any means, but at least I do have that ability. But, you know, hopefully this guy gives you guys an idea of kind of what it was like to operate that attraction. There was a ton of information on the backstage secrets. You know, I went over everything you needed to know um, regarding how they loaded the cars onto the attraction, how they unloaded the cars off the attraction. And, of course, you kind of heard a little bit about maintenance. There is a maintenance bay uh, behind the attraction, as you guys kind of figured. Uh, you kind of learned a little bit about the positions, but you're going to learn more about it Um Tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, because I am going to be by myself all afternoon, so. And not to mention, there is no praise band rehearsal tomorrow evening, so I guarantee there is going to be another vlog tomorrow. Afternoon, that is. And tomorrow is going to be an easy day for me, because I'm just cashiering, and I go out at 6 in the morning. Ooh, so much fun. <laughs> and I get to find out how much I'm paid on Thursday. Yeah. At least tomorrow is my easy day. I'm... I actually do look forward to working on Wednesdays, not the 6 in the morning part, but I do actually like working on Wednesdays. It's Tuesdays and Thursdays are a little more challenging because I'm outside all day long pushing cars and collecting trash, and it's just getting uh, repetitive and mundane and annoying and frustrating and getting me irritable. But there are some uh, pros to the job, which is good. But yes, uh, tune back in tomorrow. I mean, when I go over all the different positions, I'm going to literally start with position when I have the entire rotation memorized, which is crazy considering how long it's been since I've worked at that attraction. I'll go every over every single position in full detail, and um, I'll even go over all the different hand signals with you guys. And then I don't know if... I have a chapter designated to um, 
like different stories I have for you guys regarding guests. I don't believe so, so I think I'll just uh, kind of do that as an optional, or well, not an optional chapter, but as an extra chapter, I will talk to you guys about a different guest that I encountered while I was working there and some of the funny stories I have for you guys. Not to mention, I have some really uh, positive stories that might lift your spirits. So, yeah, I think I'll do that tomorrow as well because I have so much time tomorrow that I'll just do two vlogs on that tomorrow. And I do miss Disney a lot right now, so I'm enjoying just talking about Disney. It's bringing back good old memories. And the more I talk about Tomorrowland Speedway, the more I remember it, which is a good thing. But, yeah, I hope you guys really enjoy this. I'm sorry it was so long, but I cannot believe how much uh, information there was. Once again, I still don't have anything new to talk to you guys about of KTJ. Tomorrow is the last day of the month. So, starting Thursday, we'll be officially a little over a month away from them visiting. Yay! So excited. All right. I will see you guys in the next vlog. And always remember, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Have a great night. Peace out.